Okay, we are live. So, welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. Today is a special episode because it's the first time we're trying out a video live stream, so please bear with us. If you're joining us for the first time, my name is Sean Weisbrot. I'm an American entrepreneur, investor, and advisor who's been living in Southeast Asia for 13 years. This is our 15th episode, so definitely go to welivetobuild.com to check out the other episodes we've done before. Our guest today is Frank Olschlager, an American entrepreneur based in Virginia. He's the managing director of 10 Square Miles, which focuses on helping large-scale clients digitize and automate their systems. We're going to talk about automation and why it should eat your company, and I hope you like this special new format. So thank you very much for joining us. I know it's early in the morning for you over there in Virginia. It's evening for me. So thank you for taking the time to join us today. Absolutely. So we've we've got both ends of the clock here. Yeah, exactly. We're exactly 12 hours apart. And I always love having these conversations because there's something going on where I am and something going on where you are. And, you know, it's always fun to see the differences in that. So let's get started. Why don't you start by telling people a little bit about how you got into being an entrepreneur, especially with the tech side and basically how you came to found this company, 10, uh, 10 Miles Square. Ten, yeah, 10 Miles Square. Uh, yeah, sure thing. Um, so uh, one quick clarification is I did not found 10 Miles Square. Um, and I'll tell you how I got there as, as part of the story, actually, because uh, it's, it's pretty sure. interesting uh, in and of itself. Uh, so, uh, you know, I had, I, I guess I always had the entrepreneurial spirit, you know, even in um, like middle school, me and uh, my cousin, uh, discovered that uh, people threw bicycles away on on special trash day, uh, and you know most of the bicycles weren't serviceable by themselves. But if you picked them all up and brought them back to the garage, you could make Frankenstein bikes um, that actually looked and, and worked pretty well. And so we created a summer business where we rescued bicycles, fixed them up, painted them, and then sold them out of my grandfather's garage. And they had a little bike shop running and pretty soon other kids started coming to us for repairs. So we had a used bike and repair shop up and running for the summer. Uh, I don't recall exactly how much money we made, but it's really more than any seventh grader should be entitled to. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's kind of how I got my start uh, with, with entrepreneurism. And, uh, you know, then when I grew up, uh, you know, I, I launched my first real software company in, in 1996. And uh, that was one of those really cool, uh, you know, that was right in the middle of the dot-com boom. And uh, so we raised a lot of money, uh, expanded very quickly, had a footprint on, on three continents at, at one point. Um, you know, so that was, that was quite a ride uh, and the dot-com uh, bust came. Everybody remembers that. So, you know, we all adjusted from that and went off and, and started new companies, uh, you know, to try to compete in, you know, and how the market had changed. Uh, so I've done that, you know, four or five times. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Alden Hart, who's one, my, one of my partners uh, at 10 Mile Square, uh, came along uh, right when I was selling a software company to SAP and told me they were starting this company, 10 Mile Square, that I want to join. And I thought, well, you know, I'm selling my company to SAP. That's probably going to be somewhat lucrative. I'm going to ride that out. <laughs> uh, so I did that, um, did my uh, my uh, golden handcuff slash indentured servitude on, on the other side of, of the acquisition. Uh, and then when that was finished, I came back around and, and joined 10 Mile Square. So I, I can't I can't be one of the founders, but, uh, you know, been there pretty close to the beginning. To be fair, in my intro, I believe I just said you were the managing director. I didn't say that you founded it. Uh, no, okay, thank you for that's great. I thought I heard you say that, that you founded it, that I founded one of the founders, but that's okay. Um, no, no worries. Uh, you know, to, that's my story. Uh, I, you know, I hope it's you know not longer than you expected. But uh... this is not about time. This is just about you know saying what needs to be said to so that people feel good and so that you feel good and all that. Okay, so you're now part of 10 Miles Square. What gave you the idea to focus on helping these large companies to digitize and automate themselves? So, you know, there's clearly a present need in, in the market 
uh, for um, you know digital transformation is is the sort of operative buzzword that that a lot of folks use, and, and that can mean a lot of of different things. Uh, because you know, once upon a time, you know, being automated, having having automation around things that need to be highly reliable and, and repeatable uh, was a secret weapon, right? You know, a lot of a lot of companies really hadn't caught on to that yet. And you know, if you could automate, so for example, if you're a software company and you've automated your entire value chain from you know development environments all the way up to production. So that you know, deploying a new feature is essentially a non-event. Um, you know, you're way ahead. At one time, you were way ahead of pretty much every other software company out there. I mean, I'm sure you've been part of the, you know, hey, we're going to deploy our software, cancel your weekend plans, and everybody plan on sleeping in the office until you know we get all the bugs worked out in production. <laughs> you know, uh, that that seems to be the norm in in the software industry for a long time. And automation can basically turn that into a, you know, okay, we're going to deploy, uh, you know, everybody hang on five minutes and, you know, let's make sure, you know, all the tests passed and then we should be good to go. And, uh, you know, that's, that's really, that's really our experience. Yeah. And, and that's how we do that's been my secret weapon through a good bit of my career is, you know, you, you bake in the stuff that works, you know, and you automate it. And if it needs to be really highly repeatable and you don't want any surprises, um, you know, then you can automate it, you know, and it, it's becoming more and more now that with the cloud in particular, you know, which is a, is a destination or at least a strategic piece of most people's digital transformation strategies, uh, is automation is critical. If, if you're not automated in how you operate in the cloud, you're not even going to be able to compete in today's market. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, automation is something that we started thinking about a, probably a month or two after we started developing mm -hmm. anything. Yeah. I was like, wait a minute, we're, we're going to have an Android version and an iOS version and all of these different operating systems and we're running it all through GitLab and it has to go through the different uh, app stores and all that. So we made sure that we went and did that. We'll, we'll talk more about that a little bit later because I'm sure most people still don't really understand what automation is and all that. So yeah. let's take a step back and let's talk about what is automation and why is it important, not only right now, but for the future? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll start by answering that question really in, in reverse. Um, why it's going to be important for the future and actually why it's important already now is if if you don't have your critical processes automated that that generate you know the value for your company whatever it is you know if it's technology um you know discrete manufacturing process manufacturing um you know think of pharmaceuticals for example you know if if the processes that create that end value for the market aren't automated then you're you're your competitors are going to run circles around you. you. You're not going to be able to compete effectively in the market. So that's that's why it's important. And in the future, it's only going to get more and more true. And you know, there's going to be some interesting sort of twists and turns along the way, right? So when you look at the convergence of multiple technologies, uh, you know, say machine learning type algorithms, and you know, you start to hook those into your automation chain. Um, you know, then you can start to think of some really interesting ways to do things uh, that, you know, your competitors aren't going to be able to do. And there are companies that are already doing that. That's this is not science fiction. This is this is already uh, a real thing in production in the world in, in a number of different industries. Um, so I think, you know, that's kind of where the immediate future is, is going for that. So the other part of your question, really, which is what is automation? Um, I think the simplest way to express it is is that it's making repeatable a a set of steps or or a process, uh, you know, so that it executes the same way every time. And you, when you have good automation, you know, you can iterate on that, and it's not too hard to change what that automation does um, as you learn or or as you need to adapt to other changes, you know, other forces that are around you. 
All right. I think that's a fairly simple example and hopefully something that uh, the audience will be able to understand. So let's go a little bit deeper then and tell me what is one of the simplest forms of automation that any company could could apply as the first thing they do for their company? Uh, email autoresponder. You know, we've thank you for contacting customer support slash customer success. Uh, we've received your email. Uh, here's a case number. Uh, we'll be in touch shortly. I, I can't think of a simpler piece of automation um, that accomplishes something of value. It lets your customer know that, you know, they've received whatever it is, you know, uh, that was sent and uh, that they're acting on it. And, and as a customer, you know, that makes me feel good. It's like, you know, my email didn't go into the void. You know, they got it. And, you know, for me in particular, because of my background, I say, oh, look, they've automated this process. That's good. It's not going to fall through the cracks. <laughs> you know, you get a handwritten email from Kelly, you know, uh, a day later, uh, then you're kind of thinking, well, is she going to follow up on that? Or, you know, she's clearly doing everything herself. Or you get yeah, no email, email at all. Yeah, are pretty good. Yeah. I, I can't recall experiencing not getting an autoresponder. So I, it, it must have been a long time ago that they yeah. started. That started a long time ago. Yeah. But it's, I, it's really the simplest form of automation that, that I can think of. Right. You know, today, you know, that's just the first step in a long automated process. So when that email comes in to your company, you know, it gets caught by, you know, a, a customer relationship management system, a CRM or, or, you know, one of the other flavors of things that interact with, you know, customer uh, communications. And, you know, that gets, you know, you know, basically a set of actions get created around that. You know, some are, some are automated, some might have, uh, you know, a person in the loop, human in the loop. Uh, where, you know, somebody's expected to do something, but, you know, even they're acting on that and completing that task, you know, if it's all going through the CRM system, will, you know, trigger other actions to happen. Uh, you know, it might be that, you know, a, a support case gets escalated. It might be a support case gets resolved. It might be, um, you know, we, we need to send out a, a replacement part or something like that. So, you know, a lot of different things can happen from that and and having all of that in place all the way through the entire life cycle of, of that, you know, type of engagement, whether it was, you know, a support email or a request for a price or something like that, um, you know, it can really kind of keep things going. So some people might not understand email uh, autoresponders. So would you say it makes sense to develop something custom or is there a service you would recommend that they could use that has email autoresponders built into them? Yeah, all, almost every email service has autoresponders built into it. Um, and, you know, if your needs are just very simple, uh, you know, I acknowledge that I got your email and you'll hear from somebody, then, you know, that's that's probably sufficient. If your needs are a little more complex than that, then almost every CRM tool on the market today uh, and a lot of marketing automation tools as well offer the capability to write, um, you know, very custom scripts uh, without having to develop anything yourself. So I think this is, you know, a very commoditized capability and in really I can think of no circumstance that I would tell a team to, to build their own autoresponder, unless we were going to take on the marketing automation market and, and we had to have that native functionality. You know, if I'm just a company selling widgets, no, no way I'm going to write that custom. There, there's no point. Fair enough. So then what are the tools that, that do these things? You were talking about a CRM, um, for example, what, what are your favorite go-to tools for these kinds of tasks that people can look at and pay for, for like a small to medium-sized business? Yeah, I hate all of them. Um, <laughs> they, <laughs> well, I they, they are honesty. a necessary evil in, 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 the, in the market. So we're actually going, at my company, uh, 10 Miles Square right now, we're, we're actually going through an exercise um, 
where we are looking at our marketing automation and we've you know we're a technology firm but we're not a marketing firm so uh, we're working with a digital marketing agency and um you know i i expect that our tool chain um is going to change as a result of this of this process so you know i don't i don't i can't really say that i have any favorite you know tools um i think the the ones that most people know um are things like mailchimp um that's a very very simple crm that um has some really good uh, email automation built into it it's great for nurturing customer relationships um and you know then there's things like salesforce um you know more technical companies uh like tools like jira um for capturing you know work that has to come back to development uh as a, as a result of customer issues um you know there's systems like pipe drive and and i'm just throwing these names out as ones that you know people may have heard of before uh, i mean no endorsement of, of any tool whatsoever here um there yeah, and and i mean there's there's dozens and dozens of of these kinds of tools on the market for for the front end um completely different tool sets, right? So that's an important point too, is depending on what you're trying to automate, there's probably a unique set of tools out in the market to help you with that. You know, so for example, if I'm automating my development pipeline, then, you know, I'm not using Salesforce or, or anything like that, right? I got a completely different set of tools, right? Um, could be AWS CloudFormation, could be Terraform, you know, could have some Jenkins mixed in there. You know, there's just completely different sets of tools. Did you hear Salesforce just announced they're going to be buying Slack for twenty seven point seven billion? I've been dollars. tracking that for the last couple of few days, and um, I'm still processing that emotionally. I don't know how I feel about it. Uh. <laughs> what, it so tell me what 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 emotions are you feeling about it? I know how I'm feeling. So um, we actually rely very heavily on Slack uh, at, at Ten Mile Square. Uh, it has replaced email for most conversations. Um, you know, we're also, we're, we're a technology and product uh, consulting company. And so we have found it really efficient to set up shared Slack channels with our clients. And it's a really nice model because, you know, now we can have, you know, true asynchronous team, you know, dynamic conversations, you know, with our clients during our projects, uh, all completely secure and, and separated. Uh, you know, so, you know, we've got two or three clients, you know, in our, in our workspace, but on dedicated shared channels. Uh, so it's just created a really seamless way for, for us to work with our customers. I really, really like that. My, my concern with Microsoft is that, um, they're going to integrate it with teams and that will be a travesty. <laughs> well, it's Salesforce isn't owned by Microsoft, is it? So uh, we're talking about Slack. Yes, Salesforce was buying Slack. Oh, Salesforce is buying Slack. Yeah, they they've announced twenty seven point seven billion dollars. Okay. Twenty seven point. Yeah, twenty seven. So you know dollars. what's funny is I thought okay, um, then you can basically ignore everything that I just said um, because I thought I read yesterday that Microsoft had put on a in a bid to buy Slack. It's possible. But, I didn't hear that, but, but the news maybe is maybe I'm remembering it wrong, or I saw it wrong, or or something like that. It's truly possible. Yeah, twenty seven point seven billion dollars. Yeah. It's a lot of money. I know, and if yeah. you actually look at their financials, it doesn't make any sense unless they're either hiding something really good that nobody like it's in the it's in the pipeline. Nobody knows that what they're building, or just bad decisions all around. Uh, you know, I, so I, I don't know. I actually think a Salesforce acquisition of Slack makes a lot of sense for Salesforce. Yes, but does it make sense for Slack? You know, it, that really comes down to the investors. And, uh, you know, my guess is that the acquisition is pretty enough on paper that they're like, yeah, we're good. It's time to exit. I mean, I, I've looked at some of their financials because Slack is a competitor for my startup. Right. And they're basically losing like almost $200 million a year right now. 
whether or not they're ca making very calculated decisions to reinvest in R and D that nobody can see the the benefits of, um, in terms of new functions and features, or they're poorly mismanaging their funds, like most large growth companies uh, that are like recently public and coming out of Silicon Valley and all that. Mm -hmm. So my my back of the paper calculation was that they just sold for 60 times a multiple of their revenue which is insane for SaaS. 20x okay maybe that would give them what an 8 billion dollar valuation but they were already publicly trading at 17 18 billion before the announcement that they were talking about it last week which then pushed them to 25 and then they sold for it's just insane to be honest yeah So, Anyways. Yeah. so what is a more intermediate level piece of automation that a company could introduce? So I think, you know, that really depends on the kind of company uh, that, that you are. So, you know, if you are a technology company, then, you know, and we mentioned this a little bit earlier is, you know, you really want to automate uh, your uh, development process. You know, how how does your company? So I think it always comes down to the first question that you're asking is, um, how does the company create value? And, and sort of what you're really asking there is, you know, how do we get to revenue? Right. What are the processes that stand between us and, and revenue? And, you know, that that's really a good place to look. Um, you know, you might also look. There's another question that you could ask. And um, there's there's a whole ecosystem around this, uh, around theory of constraints is you might look at, at the company and say, you know, where are the bottlenecks? Um, cause you know, there's probably good opportunities for, you know, uh, creating some automation, uh, to help solve those bottlenecks, you know, even if not at the bottleneck point, maybe somewhere else, um, you know, that, that could use some, some help. So I think, you know, that's kind of a couple of questions that you can ask to figure out, you know, what you want to automate and i think a mid-level you know automation you know technology company you know it's it's the ci cd continuous integration continuous delivery right you know if you can get to that um you know then you know you're at least on a level playing field with with you know all other advanced you know technology companies that that have figured this out um so can you can you really quick really quick explain what continuous Iter is com continuous iteration and continuous it, development? In integration, yeah, continuous integration, uh, continuous delivery. So um, continuous integration is, is the concept that uh, every time a change is introduced in the software or the configuration that a, a build is performed and tests are run so that you know that that change didn't break something that was already working. Um, you know, that's sort of the, the simple definition uh, of it. We've, if anybody wants to go to our, our website, there's a, a much longer discussion on continuous integration and, and continuous delivery, but you know, that's sort of the heart of it. Continuous delivery takes continuous integration to the next level and actually pushes that change through that process uh, all the way out to production. And so when you think about companies like Spotify or Amazon, um, you know, other, other sort of big, you know, high tech companies like that, you know, they push out, you know, hundreds, if, if not thousands of change changes into production every day. And, and, you know, they've automated that process, uh, you know, end to end. And, uh, it, you know, a, a change introduced by a developer can literally be in production uh, you know, less than an hour later, um, in, in, you know, these highly automated, you know, capabilities. Uh, so that's, that's what, you know, sort of the golden state or the, uh, the ideal of, of continuous delivery looks like. Okay. And, uh, you had mentioned a term before Jenkins and yeah. I believe Jenkins is a form of continuous integration yeah, so and continuous. Yeah, so Jenkins is a is a tool, um, and it basically manages software builds, uh, you know, uh, using automation and rules. Okay, 
we so we use uh, GitLab, and mm -hmm. so the CI/CD scripts that our lead developer created were going through GitLab's uh, builds. That's another great and tool tied to our repositories. Yeah, yep. so it's been fantastic for us and makes it really easy to uh, make sure that things get done without going, hey, can you push that? Hey, can you push yep. that? Can you push that? So, so the way that ours is set up is um, when a new commit, when a new code commit is pushed to the repository on the uh, either a feature branch or a develop branch, then the build happens through the script. But then when we have an entire feature branch, let's say we're developing a file manager, right? If once all of the features for the file manager branch, feature branch are done, we'll then do a regression test and then we'll consciously choose to push it to the develop branch. Mm -hmm. And after testing on the develop branch, we'll then manually push it to the staging, which is where our production happens. And so uh, it's the staging branch. And that way we're not uh, potentially exposing bugs because even with regression testing and with bug testing, it could still happen. Mm -hmm. And um, we just don't want to break things as people are using them. Yeah. That makes sense. That's pretty, pretty standard Git flow um, that you've described there. Yeah. So hopefully everybody else is able to understand it. Um, if not, uh, sorry, ask your tech people. It, I, <laughs> I am a non-technical founder of my company and I've just learned this stuff from my team. So, if I can learn it, anybody can learn it. And I think that's, I think part of learning how to automate your company is also upskilling yourself as a founder so that you can understand what the hell is going on in your company, especially yep. on the tech side. Because so many, I, I've heard of so many people building something and like they don't know what they're building. Like they'll say, oh, I know what we want to build, but the end result is something totally different and they don't even understand what they're building. So I think it's really important for any founder to be uh, involved in the tech side of what's going on. So let's talk a, more about a complex automation, which may be something that you look at when you're working with your clients. So, you know, I think a, a really good example of, of a complex one that we did um, it, for this is for a fairly major well-known uh media company uh who probably everybody watching this has, has watched at least one of their one of their tv shows um when we started working with them they were a essentially a tape-based uh production house uh, so all of their tv shows were were filmed uh, onto physical media and, and then processed in, in studios and, you know, they had to be, you know, manually edited uh, to, you know, basically create different versions for, you know, distribution. And, and then they physically boxed up all the different copies and, and sent them out to, uh, you know, all the cable channels and, you know, other, you know, broadcasters uh, that they had deals with. So, what we did is, is we worked with them uh, to digitize all of that content there. And they're all completely 100% digital. Now they do everything digital native um, at this point. But uh, we helped them uh, basically digitize all of their content. And that's not to say we were sitting around feeding tapes in the machines. They did all that. What, what we did is we designed an architecture for a digital asset management system. Uh, and a strategy by which, you know, once they digitized all this content, um, they would have all sorts of new capabilities that, that they didn't really have today. So for example, you know, if somebody wants to find uh, the episode of the Emerald Lagasse show, you know, where, you know, you know, he says, you know, bam, three times in a row or something like that, because they want to use it in a, in a promo, um, you know, they can go to, uh, in an online application and search for that. And the reason they were able to do that is that the, uh, both the, the foreign language and, and the hearing impaired closed captioning, uh, when these things were digitized, uh, that was time coded, uh, we, because the closed captions have time coding information in them. 
you know, you can also just ingest those into the digital asset management system and index that. And, and by doing that, you make the entire archive 100% uh, you know, text searchable, which is a capability that, that they couldn't even, you know, hadn't even imagined as, as a possibility. Uh, and so that becomes an easy way for them to do things. And, and now, of course, um, you can completely automate, you know, the uh, process of taking that digital content and transcoding it, both, you know, having it um, edited for a format and, and transcoding it uh, on an automated, you know, pipeline. And, and then, of course, um, distributed, you know, digitally. No, no more putting things in boxes and, and mailing them around the world. Um, you know, it's just essentially uh, almost streamed. Um, not streamed like you and I would stream a TV show from from AWS, but you know, streamed over the web or over the internet, uh, so that you know the the broadcaster can get it. So if you're a broadcaster in Germany that has a license for a TV show, and you show it with German closed captions. Um, you know, it, you just access that digitally and, you know, suck it down in, into your own uh, broadcast mechanism and, and then you pair it from there. Uh, so it's really, it completely changed the game uh, for really this this media company's in, entire business model. That sounds like a lot of hard work. So what was the most, what was the weirdest thing about that experience? The weirdest thing about that experience, or um, any any experience in your career working with other companies and all that. Um, I don't I don't really know what the what the weirdest thing in my experience is. Uh, you know, I, I've seen companies do a, a lot of strange things. Um, So I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of I'm really struggling with with where the where the weirdest experiences. Um, we well, said you you've seen them do strange things. So so you know I've seen companies do strange things. So you know we saw and again we were a technology consulting firm and so we we work with a lot of companies that depend on technology and, and a lot of companies that are themselves technology you know companies. So a lot of my examples are going to you know come from from that arena. Um, but I think, you know, one thing that I saw that just really flabbergasted me is uh, we discovered that a client um, and this was during an assessment that we did for them at the at the request of their CEO. Uh, so backstory is this this customer um, before they met us had not been able to deploy a new version to production successfully in over a year because every time they tried stuff broke and crashed and and then it took you know their entire technology team hours and hours and hours to get things back up and, and running again it was very very sprawling very un, unstable system and so the ceo asked us to come in and see what it was going to take to to fix that problem and, and and to fix their their technology so it didn't behave like that anymore so we got in there and we're doing our assessment and we discovered that one of the core pieces of, of software that was was deployed uh, that they had running, uh, they had no source code for. And they and they didn't know how it worked. Um, they only knew that if it wasn't running, that the the system didn't work correctly. And so okay. we had yeah, That's definitely weird. It very, it was just, it was crazy, right? And they were just completely dependent on on this thing. And it turns out that it had been built by some developer that they'd had a couple of years ago, um, who never checked it in to any kind of, you know, source control system, you know, like Git, um, or, you know, these guys, I think were using Subversion uh, back at the time, um, which is another tool that, that does that kind of stuff. Um, but the developer had never checked it in, in to Git, and when he left the company, uh, the IT department took his laptop and scrubbed it. So, no source code. So one of the things that had, and you know, luckily it was was Java. Um, so basically, the, they had to reverse compile the the application and, and reverse engineer it, and 
uh, ultimately it, it had to be replaced with, you know, uh, something, something new that was, was rewritten uh, to do the same thing. And their whole architecture changed. Um, and that's another, another good success story. We worked with them for about uh, three years and, uh, you know, they, they are now completely, this will be a surprise, no surprise to you. Um, they are now completely automated uh, in, in their entire uh, build chain, uh, value chain from development uh, all the way up through, uh, you know, their ability to deploy. Uh, it's one of the things that we did there. And, you know, they've evolved their architecture uh, initially under our guidance to eliminate a lot of the fragility uh, you know, that was there. And they had a lot of mixing of, um, and from architecture speak, uh, what I call separation of concerns. So for example, um, you don't want your auth service to also be responsible for, you know, logging, uh, you know, in the system. And so if you have one, sir, you know, sort of one piece of software that is, you know, doing authentication and also doing all the logging, there's, there's no separation of concerns there. And you know, you can easily break your authentication service by making a change to how, you know, what how logging works because they're they're intermingled, uh, and and right. you don't want that. And that that's not a real example, but I, just a silly one I picked, you know, because it's illustrative. Well, thanks. I appreciate the example. I know um, we never had anything like that happen in my company, but. We did have a developer, we had a backend developer who thought he was the architect, even though we already had an architect when we hired him to be the backend developer. And he spent six months basically developing a backend that ignored the entire wiki documentation about <laughs> the endpoints and everything. Oh boy. And so I was I was sitting there going, why is it not working? Like why there's so many problems at that point. Our front end developers were developing a lot of the UI and using dummy data in order to just show that things could work without actually having endpoints that connected properly. And it was a mess. It wasn't until about five or six months that we realized or that I understood what was happening and uh, fired him immediately and then hired another guy. He spent two months fixing the entire back end to make sure it aligned perfectly with the wiki. He spent a tremendous amount of energy making the, the documentation like amazing. Um, and now we've got a, a beautiful system that purrs nicely, but it took a long time. It took two or three months just to get it to a point where it could support the functions we had already developed and documented. Um, and, and he was actually with us for another year and a half. He's actually, he's just leaving us actually next week, unfortunately. Um, which is a shame, but he helped us to find a replacement and he's training them. So everything's all right. But, um, but yeah, I'm sure there's a lot more stories like that out there. So I'm curious to know what is it that makes you passionate about tech and helping other companies through this process? Yeah. So, um, it, you know, why am I passionate about tech? I don't know. It's just uh, kind of wired into uh my life uh i've always always been passionate about tech um and and what it can do right not really just tech for for tech's sake uh you know i'm really when you look at the application of technology it has to start with you know what is the business trying to accomplish and and that can be different you know for for every business on, under the sun um, if it, you know, everybody's got their own things that they're, they're trying to do. And essentially the job of tech is to, uh, make that business goal achievable, uh, and uh, usually uh, or often in, in a sustainable way, uh, because a, a business, you know, once it gets to a certain goal, it will often replace that goal with another one in, in line, right? So, you know, you might initially have a goal of getting to 5 million in revenue and, and then 10 million in revenue and then 25 and then 50 and then 100. Um, and, you know, the, the role of technology in, in that goal uh, is in whatever way necessary to enable the company to accomplish that goal. 
and, and again in a sustainable way because you know if you can get from five to ten but you can't get from ten to twenty five because the tech doesn't support that uh, then you know tech didn't really do its job I think a, a good example uh, of that and, and this might be a little controversial for some people I guess but um, in the mid 90s uh, there was a sort of a newish uh, or new again under the sun uh, business model called application service provider and you know these were companies that you know basically set up servers and data centers or, or even had data centers and ran your application for you uh, the problem was is that there was unlike the SaaS model um, there was no call concept of multi-tenancy or you know um, being able to uh, even really share uh, you know machine horsepower uh, uh, you know cost effectively uh, so you know for every customer you had to run up you know another another set of servers and so ultimately as a business model you know that wasn't really very scalable um, and, and that's why you don't really see a lot of ASPs around anymore. And, and SaaS has really become the, the prevailing model because the switch to SaaS, um, and you know, SaaS is a business model, but it's it's also it, it's an architectural model, right? You know, so if your application is not multi-tenant, and and what I mean by multi-tenant is, you know, I can be a customer, you can be a customer, you know, somebody else over there can be a customer. And, you know, we might all be running on, you know, the exact same, you know, CPU, uh, the same computer, uh, same set of servers calling the exact same instances of the same services. But the architecture uh, keeps all of our data uh, completely separate and, and secure from each other. So I can see my data, but there's no possible chance I'll, I'll ever see Sean's data or, or anybody else's data on the system. Um, and that allows for an economy of scale. So, you know, SaaS as a technology sustainably enables a, a growth revenue capability that application service provider did not. And, and so I think that's sort of an, an interesting example of how one technology model, you know, basically caps out um, and, and doesn't provide uh, you know, profitability and, and revenue scalability, while another approach to technology that essentially does accomplishes the same thing, you know, makes the software remote from the customer um, so that they don't have to operate it themselves, um, you know, does not only provides a, a revenue scalability model, but has proven uh, to generate, uh, what was it, 80x returns <laughs> on investment? Oh, yeah, slap, slap this for 60x, but what what I've seen is more like uh, 10 to 15 is... Yeah, 10 to 15 is much more, much more common. Um, but, you know, it's as soon as we started talking about unicorns, the world, you know, shifted on its axis anyway. So, you know, I think we're occasionally you get these really wild valuations that come up in the market and uh, you just kind of scratch your head. Um, but, you know, they, well, the, the problem with valuations is all you have to do is raise X amount of money at Y valuation and you got yourself a unicorn. I mean, yeah. it, it doesn't have to actually derive value. You could be burning a hundred million dollars a year yep. and still raise two hundred million dollars at a five billion dollar valuation and you're a unicorn. It's yeah it's not based on any substance. So it's really interesting to see this divergence between I'm a VC funded startup and I'm a bootstrap to profit startup. Because for example, I've got friends that started a, a SaaS company from from you know from scratch, they coded everything themselves. They built everything themselves. They now have a team of 25. Mm -hmm. They did nearly $10 million in revenue last year. But they're not worth $200 million. Yeah. Nobody's buying them for $600 million. They're worth maybe 40 or 50. Yeah. Well, you know, they're, 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 they're different games, right? So I've done both um, VC backed startups and self funded uh, or organically grown startups. And you know, you're ultimately pursuing a completely different strategy um, in those business models. You know, when, you know, two things happen. When, when you take venture capital money, um, you've basically almost priced yourself out of getting rich on the deal as, as the founder, right? You know, if, if, 
you're self-funded and you're putting money into it, you know, you can exit at $20 million and you're doing good, right? Because that $20 million, most of it went into your pocket, right? You take $10 million from a VC, you know, you better be talking about, you know, a hundred million dollars at a minimum, you know, if you think you're going to get rich off the deal. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at Stuart Butter Butterfield, he's walking away with uh, at least four or five bill in cash. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's but it's a different game. And, and when you take VC money, you know, there's a. A whole there's a, a different emphasis on on growth. Right. When you're doing things organically, you know, you, you tend to grow a little slower and you, you make measured risks. Um, but when you take venture capital money, oftentimes it's, you know, build out, build out for success and uh, hit the market. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I was quite successful in my previous businesses and I was able to use that to fund my current startup. If I was probably older and wiser, I probably would have tried to build something small enough that I could have funded to profit and then used the profit from that company to fund a massive startup so that I wouldn't need VC money. I could just fund myself. And I, I went the opposite. I'm funding the company as far as I can, seeking VC money, growing it as large as I can, and then mm -hmm doing what everybody else does, which is right. keep building until you're tired of it. But um, the or until somebody that, offers you 60 X on revenue so that you can uh, exit. Um, <laughs> the minute somebody offers me 60 X, here you go. Done. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's, there's no there's no conversation about that. That's just a yeah. Thank you, sir or ma'am. Yep. Thank you for your money. Thank you for your time. Have a nice life. See you later. But actually, Stuart's going to be staying on as CEO. So I imagine he's probably going to figure out, um, you know, surely there's going to be some synergy, uh, which for those of you who don't understand what synergy yet means, it means basically there's too many people. It costs too much to manage them. We're going to fire them and figure out how to turn this company into something profitable. And uh, so I imagine he might spend the next two years just staying on as CEO, working on who's going to replace him so he can become chairman. Um, chances are that'll be someone from Salesforce walking in, for like maybe some VP somewhere will end up running Slack in two or three years. And uh, he'll just, you know, so, ba so basically Stuart will start the integration process because uh, Slack's going to become a unit of uh, Salesforce. And so they'll be working very closely together, their teams, in order to figure out how to more deeply integrate the systems. Um, so yeah, I've, I've been watching this and I've been watching Slack for a, a long time. So it's very interesting to see. And it makes me hopeful that I could sell Sidekick later in the future for a number that is also uh, very fair. <laughs> and fair. <laughs> So what's something that you've learned recently that you're implementing into your life? It can be professional or personal. Something I've learned recently that I'm, I'm implementing in my life. Um, yeah. Let's see. Um, I don't know. I, I, I learn a lot of things. Um, I'm kind of an older guy now, so I don't make a lot of changes in, in my life. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you don't um, can't teach an old dog new you tricks. You don't look a day. Uh, you don't look a day over forty-eight. Day day over thirty-five, right? Um, yeah. No. Well, I'm, well. I'm almost thirty-five. I'm sorry, but you don't look thirty-five. <laughs> well, well past uh, all of that. Um, so you know, I think. Um, in terms of, I don't know, I, I, I learn stuff from people every day, but it's not all stuff that, you know, I would necessarily try to, you know, implement in my life so much as, you know, I'm informed by it, you know, the next time I, I approach a, a similar situation or, or, or something like that. Um, you know, I, some things that I, ha these are not things that I've learned recently, but I'll say the most important thing, I'm gonna change your question, Sean, because it'll be easier for me to answer. I think the most important thing that I've ever learned 
um, that I've implemented in my life. And, it, and it's a practice I continue uh, today. And, and when I work with people as, as a mentor or a coach, you know, I, I preach this stuff pretty heavily, which is um, writing down your goals and getting really crystal clear on what your goals are. And it's also really important to know, you know, really what your core values are and to make sure that your goals are, are aligned with your core, core values and, and to actively, uh, you know, sort of audit your goals, you know, for that. Um, because if, you're, if your goals and your values are out of sync, um, you know, that creates, you know, inner turmoil uh, in, in your life and in your psyche. And, and you ultimately won't accomplish that goal because you will know, be resisting and, and struggling it internally. Uh, and I'll give you a, a good concrete example of that is, is once upon a time, I thought I had a goal to be uh, a CEO of a, of a public company. And, uh, you know, was, had written that goal down and uh, was, you know, going through the exercise and you know, I thought to myself, you know, it would be really good to talk to some CEOs of, of public companies and, you know, kind of get their perspective on this. And through that process, I discovered that um, that goal was in direct conflict with one of my core values, uh, which is family. And so because, you know, when you're the CEO of a public company, you don't actually spend a lot of time at home at the dinner table or or with your kids. Uh, and so I realized that that goal was actually in, in conflict with my core values. And, and so I, I, I modified that particular goal in, into something else. I dropped that and, and decided to pursue something different that was more in line with, with my values. Um, and I think that if I could pick one thing uh, that I've learned uh, for everybody to implement in your life, that is the process of, of writing down your goals and and understanding what that means for you in your life to, if you accomplish that goal. I think it's a fantastic goal. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I'll, I'll say real quickly, uh, I experienced this kind of an issue with my company where we were struggling to understand how to talk about ourselves as a company. We, we didn't have a clear voice for the brand. And we hired someone to help us kind of figure out our voice. And one of the first things that she talked about was core values. So when we started throwing out potential core values and then narrowed them down, everything else seemed to be so much easier to express. And uh, a lot of what we shared uh, in those first few uh, sessions with her ended up in our pitch deck and will be on our white paper and our website and basically everywhere that we can shout from the rooftops, this is what we believe in. So it's a fantastic thing to write down, yeah. <laughs> write down your core values and your goals, because it, it definitely helps you understand who you are and what you want or what your business is uh, stands for and what it doesn't stand for. And, and um, that's also really important, I guess, from a, a business leader point of view where when you're trying to recruit and onboard and retain talent long term, they need to understand what the hell it is the company stands for. Yep. And you see problems like that now with Facebook and Amazon um, and recently with Coinbase where their founders basically would refuse to stand up for something that the employees thought were necessary or important to them. Yep. And um, uh, I think his name is Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase, said basically, we are a non-political organization. If you don't like that, you can quit. And yep. I think 14% of the, of the company quit because they're like, well, I'm a human being and there's things that I value and you're not, you're not only not willing to talk about them or do anything about them, but you're not even willing to acknowledge them or allow me to talk about them. So I can't work for you. Yep. Bye. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. It's interesting. You bring that up that, that, um, employees holding their employers accountable for and wanting to work for companies which are, you know, socially or ethically aligned with what they believe in uh, has, has been a, a big shift in 
the you know the, essentially the employer workforce relationship you know once once upon a time um you know that wasn't wasn't an issue or if it wasn't or if it was an issue it wasn't really at, at the surface of of things but i think we've seen over the past decade uh that people really care about you know what the companies that they work for or work with believe in and, and what they support and and to your point sometimes what they won't support you know what what they stay silent on um and that's become an important dynamic for for companies, uh, you know, employers that have to adjust to that, um, because that is now a very real thing. People will not work for you if if they think you are an evil company, or if you know, even if they don't, you know, your values as a company don't align with their values as an individual. And that's I think become a very important aspect of the relationship. Um, you know, between a, a company and, and the employees of that company. Yeah, it's definitely something that we've thought about. And I think it's something that millennials really started. I don't remember my, my parents' generation ever really having these kinds of ideas. Um, See, so yeah, I, I think it's something that my generation started. And I think Gen Z has become much more adamant about and I don't see this going away. I mean, I'm totally in favor, you know, as a millennial, I'm, I'm very passionate about certain issues. And uh, while I won't mention them here, I, I hope that my employees feel passionately about them as well. I don't like make it a point to talk to them about those issues, but if they were to come to me and talk about it, I'd, you know, I would say, sure, like, let's talk about it. Um, and I would, you know, do my best to support them in, in their goals and their desires. Um, but I, I think just in general, a, a millennial and a Gen Z workforce require, like, it, for, for our generations, it's not a paycheck. They see work as being something that needs to fulfill this deeper need for connection, purpose, advancement, and, and also these social needs. Um, this, this need to belong, to be loved, to be appreciated and respected, and they want to hear these things. They want to see you say and do things that make them feel this way, which is something that my parents' generation and, and their parents' generation, they were just happy to have a job, and they would have the same job for their whole career almost. Um, my grandfather, for example, worked for a company called Zep, and he was a door-to-door -door chemical salesman for like 35, 40 years. Same company. Yeah. And now it's it's unheard of that you would work for the same company for 40 years. Uh, you know, m the longest company I've ever worked with was about two years, and that may even be long for Gen Z, um, because I think. People are now more willing to jump between companies for the for up uh, for upward mobility for opportunities to learn new skills, uh, as well as just a feeling of of connectivity and or a, a lack of connectivity to the larger sense of purpose and all mm -hmm. that. So I, I think it's it's harder for companies because they need to put a lot more energy into the individual care of, of each employee. Um, but I also think it makes work and it makes companies better. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I think it's interesting. You, you put your finger on, on something, um, which I th which think is really true, which is that, you know, historically companies used to be sort of a, a top down inside out, uh, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, even, even companies that were more modern were essentially, somewhat kind of command and, and control um, at, at their core. And a company now really acts much more like a, an organic social organism. And if, if leadership isn't responding to, you know, the needs of, of that organism, uh, they're, they're going to find themselves uh, w without a, uh, a viable workforce, you know, pretty quickly. Uh, so I think the, the entire way a company behaves 
has basically done a 180 and, and it's and it's flipped over and you know in, instead of uh so as an example i remember my dad um he, he used to work for one of the big consulting companies way back way back in the day i won't, I won't tell you which one um but they used to send home a booklet every month um that were the uh approved brands in colors and models of shirts blazers and and trousers and, and shoes that all employees were expected to wear to the office and, wow. and there were like two shirts and you know two blazers and you know a couple of pairs of trousers two you know, like you know shoes and uh you know the company just they dictated to their employees even in what to wear to work uh you know i can't even imagine uh, a company even thinking they could get away with that today <laughs> well i mean to be fair i'm sure there's a lot of companies that aren't aware that their employees aren't wearing clothes to work <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and until the employee accidentally stands up with their camera on. Uh, yeah, that's happened. The, yeah. the Jeff, I think Jeffrey Jeffrey Tubin was fired for uh, yeah. just such a yeah I think display. He was uh, engaged in a little more than just forgetting to have pants on, but yeah, I was trying to be nice. Yeah. Well, it's been really nice talking with you. I appreciate this conversation. Uh, before we go what is something important to you that people should know about uh, something that some way they can follow you? I don't know if you're on Twitter or something that uh, you share more about different things. Tell, tell us. Yeah, ab absolutely. So, um, you know, our, our website is uh, 10 milesquare.com. Uh, there's some blog stuff up there. Um, I've got a Twitter account. Um, it's, it's just my name uh, at Frank Olschlager. But I'm not actually a very active Twitter user. Uh, you know, I I tried it for a while, but it's turned more and more into a dumpster fire. So I don't I don't spend a lot of time there <laughs> anymore. It's just disheartening. Um, but my my blog is a good place. Uh, you, you can also reach out to me, uh, you know, via email uh, if you want to hook up uh, on any topic. I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me. Believe it or not, there's more than one Frank Olschlager, but uh, my my profile is Frank E. Olschlager, uh, my middle name, uh, my middle initials in there, just to help distinguishing me from the masses of, of people that share my name. Um, I think there's seven of us on the planet. Um, it's another good way to, to get me is on LinkedIn. All right, great. So I'll, I'll have all those links in the show notes. You'll be able to find them on we live to build.com slash podcast and uh, before we go there's one thing i always say which is entrepreneurship is a marathon not a sprint so take care of yourself every day true right. that thanks thank you so much